three cheers for technology. You good to go? Hey, cheery, good morning. It is fantastic for me to stand here and see the place so full. It doesn't seem like that many years ago, and some of us remember that I would stand up here and there'd be maybe 30 people sprinkled around. This is great. God's doing wonderful things here, and I understand you keep having more people coming. How great is that? That's, uh, that's fantastic. I want to thank the musicians. I don't know where you've all disappeared to, but uh, w- wonderful job on, uh, on the music. And I don't know if you noticed, but I noticed that every one of the songs that was uh, sung this morning had a reference to the Holy Spirit, which is really appropriate because, as uh, we just heard, my task for you this morning is to open up the idea of the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, That presents us with a couple of little problems because we use some words commonly um, that don't really apply exactly in the way we use them when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Take, for example, personality. Let's say you're trying to describe someone and what they're like. So you might describe their physical appearance and then someone will say, but what, what are they really like? Oh, you mean their personality? Yeah, well, they're, they're kind and gentle and compassionate and generous and helpful, friendly. That's what we mean by personality. Of course, if they're not so nice, you might say they're obstinate and cruel, nasty, unfriendly. We, we have lots and lots of words we use to describe what someone is like. And, of course, the Holy Spirit, because he is a person, has a personality. He's he's faithful, he's reliable, he's compassionate, he's gentle, he's powerful. We could go on and on just listing aspects of the, the Holy Spirit's personality, but that's not what we're talking about. So what are we talking about? Uh, another word that might help us is personhood. Just the fact that he is a person and not, and not just an influence or a force or a power, something like that. Um, but but he is a, a, a person. Now, speaking of the word person, again, there's some confusion because of the way we regularly use it. We usually use the word person to distinguish a human from some other creature. So let me tell you about Molly. Molly's black. She has beautiful big brown eyes, very friendly, it seems she's always glad to see me, uh, and she loves squirrels and frequently chases squirrels. Really? Molly chases squirrels? So tell me more about Molly. Well, she's a dog. Oh, she's not a person. What well, you mean she's not a human? She's a dog. So we use the word person to, to kind of indicate that someone is human. But you see, the fact is that there are persons who aren't human. Uh, Satan is a person. No body, not human. I uh, think of the angels. They sometimes appeared in human form, but they're not human. Uh, fallen angels. And of course, we think of God, God the Father. Uh, we don't have a problem particularly thinking of God as a person. Or the Lord Jesus Christ, that's easy because he was a human as well as God. So we can easily imagine that he's a person. But the Holy Spirit? Hmm, that's a little tricky. You see, part of the problem, I think, is the fact that well, God the Father has a name. He's Jehovah, Yahweh, the great eternal I Am. So he has a name. Jesus, of course, That is his name. The Son of God has a name. He's Jesus. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have a name so far as I know. He's just the Holy Spirit. And that sounds kind of impersonal. Sounds like maybe he's not a person. Maybe he is just a force or an influence or a power or something like that. But you see, the fact is, he is a person. And that's what we're going to be 
looking at this morning, thinking particularly in, in terms of five areas. Now, you all are persons here this morning, uh, partly because you're human, and we all understand that humans are persons. Uh, but what are the characteristics of, of a person? Well, first of all, I would say there's consciousness, and then there's uh, an intellect, and uh, emotions, and will, or the fancy people here would want me to say volition, but we'll just say will, because we all understand that. And then I think an, a fifth area I want to look at is meaningful activity. I'm going to be discussing each one of these things in more detail as we go along. But first, uh, I would like to pray one more time. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning that on the authority of your word, we know that you are present by your Holy Spirit among us and in us, in us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have received the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives. I pray that as we spend this time together, we'll be encouraged, maybe challenged, maybe convicted, and that we will leave this place, not just with more information, uh, not just with a few fresh ideas, but that you will continue the work of transforming us into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ because of this time that we've had together today. This I pray, Father, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So the first thing I want to consider with you is consciousness. Now, why would I choose this? Well, it's because it really distinguishes a person uh, from things that are like inanimate, uh, like rocks, for example, uh, dirt. I, I'm a bit of a gardener. I like to work in the dirt. It's inanimate. There's no, there's no life there. Uh, we separate things in terms of this idea of consciousness. Now, defining consciousness, well, that's a tricky thing because it's the subject of much scientific and philosophical debate. And so if you're a scientist or a philosopher, uh, you may not like the, uh, the definition I'm going to use this morning. You'll say maybe it's not complete, but, but we have to have some idea of what consciousness is. And so let me tell you my working definition of consciousness this morning. Consciousness is the sense of one's personal identity. You, you know who you are. Um, awareness of others in the environment probably sitting beside each other, uh, you know, you're aware. And the environment, there's a, you know, so much light in here, you can hear, you know, that kind of things. Um, some sensitivities, uh, sensitivities, like they are physically related sensitivities, like sense of direction, um, temperature, uh, pain, pleasure, comfort, things like that. And uh, attitudes, you, we all have attitudes about things. That's part of what makes us conscious, makes us aware of our consciousness. And, uh, and purpose, we have intentionality. I mean, you're all here because you decided to be here. Now, you may have had a bad reason to decide to be here, but you had a reason and you're here because that's intentionality, all tied up with consciousness. Now, the Holy Spirit, we know the Holy Spirit is conscious. That might sound simple, but let's go to God's word to see an example of this. Uh, this is Matthew 10, and I'll read from 17 to 20. By the way, this passage is an example. It's not a teaching about the Holy Spirit, <laughs> per se, but it, it serves as a wonderful example of how he is conscious. 
So Jesus said this to his disciples, but beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Well, here clearly Um, the Holy Spirit has an identity. Jesus called him the spirit of your father. So he has this identity. And clearly he is aware. Uh, He knows who he is and his role. He's aware of other persons. Uh, He's aware of the persons who have been brought to the council. He's aware of those who are going to stand in judgment of them. And we know that he knows what's happening. He he understands what's happening in this situation. He has a compassionate attitude because he's going to intervene on behalf of the one who is being questioned. And he speaks on their behalf. So there's activity there. So you see that the Holy Spirit is conscious according to all of the points that we, we defined. So let's move on. Uh, Let's think about intellect. Intellect has to do with things of the mind. It has to do with knowing and learning and thinking, things like that. Now, as the Holy Spirit of God, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, he, he doesn't learn. He already knows it. I can't even wrap my head around that, what it must mean to know and never have to learn. I'm learning stuff every day. Even at my advanced age, there's still things I'm learning. Holy Spirit doesn't learn. But he certainly has a mind, and he knows some things. uh, Let me direct you to the word again. Um, Romans 8, 27 says this, Now he who searches the hearts, this is God the Father, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession, he here is the Holy Spirit, he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we have the Holy Spirit has a mind. And interestingly enough, his mind can speak to our mind. And the Father knows about our mind because the Spirit of God reveals that because he intercedes for us. And so... You can think of it in terms of the Holy Spirit being kind of a bridge between God and man, intellectually. Um, He knows the thoughts of God, and he helps us understand God's thoughts. So that's kind of going in the other direction. There's a passage about that, too. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, picking up at verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. See, each class of being uh, has its own knowledge of its own class. Uh, So God, in a class by himself... He he knows what he knows, sublime thoughts that are way above us. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, because he's God, and we're we're people kind. We're persons uh, of the human variety, and we know how other people react. I, I could predict that if the person sits beside you, gave you a jab with a pin, you'd jump. I know that. Because that's what I do. I don't care to be poked by pins, thank you very much. But, but uh, you know, I mentioned I'm a bit of a gardener. I've planted about 60 trees in the last couple of years. But I have no idea what a tree experiences when I take it out of a pot where I grew it as a seedling and put it in the ground outside in the in the harsh elements. And then I come along with my pruners and I start nipping off its branches. I don't know what the tree experiences because I'm not a tree. I'm a person. 
And so there's a gap between me and the tree. And likewise, there's a gap between God and people, humanity. But here's the cool thing about the Holy Spirit. He takes the sublime things of God and he reveals them to our human minds so that we can begin to understand who God is and how he works and what he's like and what his purposes are. Now, without the Holy Spirit, God would just be a concept. It's just a really big concept out there, and we, we wouldn't be able to relate to him, but it's through the Holy Spirit that we're able to relate to him with our minds. Indeed, we're told to love God with our minds. So we see that the Holy Spirit is conscious and that he has an intellect, he has a mind. He also has emotions, uh, negative emotions and positive emotions. And I went through a little bit of a process as I was studying this. The first thing that came to my mind was uh, grief. The Holy Spirit experiences grief. I was just telling someone at the break that uh, here's more information than you needed to know. I turned 70 in January. I know I don't look it, but I did. It's true. Since my birthday, four friends of mine in their 60s have died. So that makes me kind of look over my shoulder. These men who are younger than I am are, are dying. And they've left widows who are grieving. They, they have a sense of loss and they grieve. Now, the Holy Spirit is grieved by our sin, by our neglect of spiritual things, by our care for each other. These are the kinds of things that grieve him. But he experiences grief, a human emotion. Not maybe the same way we do, but grief is the word that we that we use to describe how he, how he feels. Thinking of some positive things, the next thing I thought of, because I'm a, I'm a romantic at heart, I thought of love. Is there a relationship between the spirit and love? Well, of course there is. In, in Romans 15.30, Paul wrote, I appeal to you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Paul, difficult situation, and he, he appeals to them uh, in part by the love of the Spirit to strive with him. The love that God puts in my heart for other Christians makes me want to help them, pray for them, intercede for them, be with them. Be what they need. Uh, and so this is the love of the Spirit. It goes beyond my own human love. I like to think that I'm a compassionate human being, but I don't always care for everybody equally. But the Holy Spirit, because he is the Spirit of love, produces that in me. Uh, then the next thing I, I bumped into was joy. First Thessalonians 1.6, and you... Paul wrote uh, to the Thessalonians, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are you thinking? Where's your mind going? Is your mind going where my mind went? As soon as I heard love, joy, what did I think of next? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness faithfulness, self-control. What's that? The fruit of the Spirit. Why, those elements of the fruit of the Spirit all sound like they involve emotion at some level. And the Holy Spirit is the one who produces this in us. You cannot give someone else what you don't have. If I had enough money, I'd like to stand at the back door and just hand out $100 bills as you go by. You'd probably rather that than just shake my hand, I know. Uh, but I don't have that money, so I can't give it to you. Well, the Holy Spirit, he has these characteristics, so he's able to give us those wonderful things that involve emotion. So we know that he's a God, a person of emotion, as well as intellect and consciousness. Well, what, what else do we have? Well, we have will. Just as Jesus' will was always submitted to the Father, 
So is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a separate will from what God wills, but he does have a will. And uh, let me let me take the scriptures, because I don't want you to take my word for it. I don't want you to go out of here and think, boy, that guy really had a lot of interesting ideas. I wonder where he got those. That would be awful. And no, I want you to be able to go out of here and say, you know, that was really helpful that, you know, he, he showed us from the Bible that this is true. So how about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11? But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And it's the Spirit's choice who gets what gift. So this person is generous and that person is helpful and somebody else has a gift of evangelism and somebody else is a great administrator. Did they apply to get those gifts? Is there a sign-up sheet? I know you're Christians, so you all have a sign-up sheet for something. You're probably going to have a sign-up sheet for your retreat. I might get somebody to sneak my name on it if there is one. But uh, anyway, um, no, you don't get the gifts of the Spirit by applying for them or signing up for them. No, the, the Holy Spirit decides that all on his own. He has a will. A couple of examples of his will <clears throat> from uh, from the book of Acts, Acts 13, 2, it says, um, as they, that is the, the Christians in the assembly there, uh, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit had decided on these two men to do a specific ministry. That was his will. It's evidence of his will that he had a job for them to do, and he knew the people he wanted to do that job. Now, this is an odd one to me. I, this really shows the sovereignty of the Spirit's will. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, we read this. Now, when they, that's Paul and his missionary colleagues, uh, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. There was Paul strategizing, thinking, and he'd been to Phrygia, and he'd been through the region of Galatia, which is a fairly large region with a number of churches. And so the next step, as far as Paul was concerned, the next sensible place to go was Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go to Asia. You're going to go the other direction. Oh, but clearly an indication that the Spirit has a will. So we're starting to, to mount a pretty serious case for the personality or the personhood of the Holy Spirit. The last category, which is the largest, and for those of you who have been clocking me to see how long I've been taken on each of these, we're not going to end five minutes early. <laughs> Sorry. If you had your hopes up. Now, this is the area of meaningful activity. Now, I was just going to say activity, but then the leaves on the trees, you know, they're starting to come out now, and they're active. When the breeze blows, they're active. They're, they're moving. But it's meaningless. Uh, we have a farm pond where I live, and if you get a test tube of water out of there, you look, there are little creatures in there can't see them with a the naked eye so much, but if you had a microscope, you could see them. What are they doing? They're moving around, but just randomly. They're, it's not like they see something over there and they go for it. No, it's just where the currents of the water take them. It's random. But meaningful activity, that's different. We all, as persons, we exhibit meaningful activity. We do things intentionally, on purpose. So uh, let me begin, and we're not going to finish this. You'll be also relieved to know that we're not going to try to finish it. Um, but the, the Holy Spirit is engaged in a great breadth of different activities. Some of them you, you know and be thinking of, and others maybe come as a bit of a surprise to you. Uh, so first of all, the first thing that came to my mind is the inspiration of Scripture. Okay? He inspired the Scriptures. Uh, we read about this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of men, uh, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
So the Bible that you have in front of you, whether it's printed on paper or on a digital screen, um, however you've got it, well, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He was the intermediary, again, between the mind of God and the mind of the, the prophets and apostles who wrote it down so that we could have it. So that's, that's one big role. Uh, there's just so many of these. He teaches. He's a teacher. Some of you are teachers. Um, you know that there's a variety of behaviors um, or activities that you do because you're a teacher. You know, you, you give lectures or classes, lessons, whatever you want to call them. You, uh, you keep tabs on your students. You grade assignments. You do all of those things. You train people. It's not just about teaching them facts, but you train them how to use their mind. Uh, these are all activities that the Holy Spirit is engaged in as a teacher. And we read about this in John 14, 26. But the helper, says Jesus, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I said to you. Can you imagine being one of the apostles, one of the 12 disciples? And you've heard Jesus preach. You've heard him talk to individuals. And, and maybe you, you, you made a few notes. I don't know if they made notes or not. Uh, but they, they come to, to the end of, of the life, of, of uh, the physical life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tell like, how are we going to remember all that? Three years worth of concentrated study and observation. Hey, they had human memories. <laughs> like Some days I can hardly remember where I live. Um, it's not really that bad. I was just a hyperbole, okay? Do you understand hyperbole, exaggeration, overstating it for the sake of making a point? Just wanted to, I'm not going to get lost going home because I have a navigation aid. But that's another story. <laughs> so anyway, um, so the Holy Spirit, then Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, he'll teach you everything you need to know, and he'll bring to your remembrance the things that you've forgotten but need to be recorded in Scripture for those people who are going to be meeting at Hilltop in 2023. Okay. Another thing, uh, he dwells in us. First Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's not really an activity per se, but he does come to dwell in us. We could spend a whole 40 minutes just talking about the significance of God, the infinite God, by his Spirit living in me. Wow. Just meditate on that and uh, expand your mind. Um, he glorifies Jesus. In John 16, 14, Jesus said, He, the Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, we've already talked about how uh, the Holy Spirit serves kind of a bridge between the, the sublime intellect of God and our limited little human intellects. Well, he also takes the things of Christ and makes them known to us. He declares them to us. Then he intercedes for us. Uh, already earlier this morning, we had uh, a reference, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, to the fact that Jesus is our high priest who intercedes for us in the sense of when, when the adversary speaks against us to the Father, he accuses us to the Father, Jesus steps in and intercedes for us. He acts as our lawyer, our advocate. Well, the Holy Spirit also intercedes for us, but in a different way. Get this. Uh, this is Romans six, or Romans eight twenty six. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we have to make a decision between two seemingly equal things. Uh, sometimes they're equally bad. Sometimes they're equally good. But how do we pray in that situation? I mentioned these 
four guys who who died in the last four months. Uh, two of them were heart attacks. They went within minutes. The other two both had cancer. How do you pray for your friends with cancer? Well, of course, you ask God to to heal them, to relieve their symptoms. Yes, that, that's that's kind of expected. But do you pray for more than that? Do you pray for them to have patience and endurance and strength and fortitude and that they will maintain a, a Christ-like gentleness as, as the medical people do all kinds of horrible things to their bodies that make them feel really uncomfortable? Um, what, do we, where, what should we pray? How do we pray? We bring the situation to God. And when we're speechless, when we get to the point where we've got nothing left to say, we have the confidence that the Holy Spirit, who knows what God's will is, and he knows our hearts, he gets into that space again and acts as a bridge, and he intercedes according to the will of God. Things that maybe aren't clear to us. But the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf regarding these things that are very difficult for us. Now, all right. By the way, I have been given permission to go over this morning. Mm -hmm. Yep. From one of the elders. Like, (laughs) is there anybody higher? Oh, straight from... Straight from him to Jesus. Uh, so, but I won't, I'll try not to abuse you too badly. Uh, let me just mention a few other things. He, he ensures our resurrection. The spirit who was in Jesus when God raised him from the dead, he's in us. That assures us of our resurrection. He sanctifies us. He makes us holy, something we could never be without us, without him. He fills us. He gives us spiritual gifts. He produces spiritual fruit. He seals us. He guides us. He empowers us. Look at how fast we're going. Amazing, isn't it? But there's one last one I I do want to read. He participates in our salvation. Now, when we think of our salvation, we think of God, the Father, and he forgives us. He reconciles us to himself. He, he brings us into this new relationship. It's fantastic. We think of the Father. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, making it possible for us to have a way to, to approach the Father. Now with the blood of Jesus, which has washed us clean of our sin, we can, we can come to the Father through the Son. Great. Did you know that the Holy Spirit has a role in this? We often forget it. Let me read you these words from Paul to Titus in chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, and having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Here we have the role of the Holy Spirit. He regenerates us. He is the one who actually effectuates, if I can use that word, brings about the new birth. It's the Spirit who regenerates us, and then he renews us. Because you know what? As long as we're in these physical bodies that we have to inhabit uh, while we're here on earth, um, we need renewing. Um, Paul talks about how the outward man is kind of deteriorating constantly, and those of you who are over 20 have probably noticed this, uh, that your body is deteriorating. Um, Those of you who are over 60 have definitely noticed uh, Yeah, our outward man is deteriorating, but inwardly we're renewed day by day. Where does that come from? Is that because you're a a good person or you eat the right food and you have good sleep patterns? No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit who's renewing us. So he regenerates us and renews us. Now, little challenge as we close. I know it's the congregation's favorite words as we close.
It is a little bit painful for me because I can think of a dozen people at least who grew up in an assembly. They were good kids. They, they were told what they should say. They were told what they should do. And they said and they did what they were told they should do. They, uh, they confessed or they professed uh, salvation. They were baptized because they were encouraged to do that. They came into fellowship. Maybe they even participated in one way or another publicly. Uh, yeah, they did it. And then, and then they get away from home. And pshht, it's all gone. Where did that go? I mean, they grew up in a home that was very godly, very faithful, maybe even strict. And when they got out of that influence, it was gone. What happened? And I know too many of these cases too close to home to ignore it. I think there are two possibilities, and this is the challenge for you. This is the challenge. Either they were just socialized into the faith, they just learned to do what to do by watching other people and obeying what they were told to do. But there was no regenerating and renewing work of the Spirit. It was just their human effort. Just like you could be socialized into being a baseball player or a musician or something like that. Uh, you know, you learn the steps, you'd get some training, and but, but it's not in your heart. Um, so there was no, maybe there was no uh, regenerating and renewing work of the Spirit. The other thing that's a possibility is that the Spirit was quenched. Uh, Paul wrote about this to the Thessalonians. He said, do not quench the Spirit. What does it mean to quench? Well, to put out a fire. We would, we, we do this in, in relationships sometime. We just, um, we just find it, it ends. We shut, shut people down. Has anybody ever shut you down? You know, you, you go to, to relate to them and they just, whoosh, and they talk about themselves. Uh, I think of, of a couple of friends. Uh, these were guys that I lived with in my university days. We go back a long way. One of them, uh, I just went to visit. He lives down near Ottawa. I made the effort to go visit him. Because we, we have an ongoing relationship. Even though we only see each other two or three times a year, if we're fortunate, uh, we maintain the connection. The other guy, yeah, I reached out to him a few times, but he never reciprocated. He never called back. And after a while, you think, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother talking to you. You don't bother talking to me. I, you know, you're you're busy with your life. Just have fun with that. Um, it could be the same way with the Spirit. Maybe he really did begin his regeneration and renewing in your life, but, but you've quenched him. You've, you've, you've shut him down, in effect. You've said, mm, yeah, I got all this other stuff in my life that's more important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on my career or my family or making money or being a famous sportsman or musician or whatever it is. We, we have something else that we put in the way of his doing his work of renewing us day by day. This is, this is an ongoing process. If you're, if you're just stuck in your spiritual life, would you reflect today on, wow, did I ever actually have an experience of regeneration, new life in me? And do I... Do I actually know what this renewing day by day is about? Maybe you did once. Maybe you didn't. If you didn't, and you're sitting here because well, it's what you do, mm, that's not enough. You need to get connected with God the Father through the Son under the power of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, maybe you, you do look back to a time when there really was spiritual life. And you've just quenched the spirit. You've shut him down. Would you consider revamping your priorities to include him? And not just include him, but to, to give him his place. He's a person. He's a person. You know how people react when they're ignored. 
kind of like me and my old college roommate who just never responded, so I quit trying. Would you, would you reach out and reestablish that contact? He is drawing you to him. I bumped into a verse in the Psalms a couple of weeks ago, and I, did, I, I think about it all the time. It says, blessed is the one you chose and have caused to approach you to dwell in your courts. This morning, I am very sure that God has caused you to approach him, even if it's just coming to this place and listening to the word. He's caused this. He has already reached out to you again. Will you respond to him? And particularly, speaking of the person of the Holy Spirit, invite him to recommence renewing you spiritually. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts are tender this morning as we think of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us at the cross. What you, as the great creator God, did in terms of sending him so that you could pardon us and reconcile sinful, wretched human beings to yourself and and your Holy Spirit who regenerates us, gives us new life, and then renews us day by day. So we humble ourselves before you. We, we recognize that, that, we are, that we are not what we should be. And we pray that we might experience the power of your Holy Spirit in us as you draw us to yourself. May we submit moment by moment to you so that you would be glorified and we would be blessed and others would be encouraged and strengthened. This we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.